Hello, my friends, and welcome to another Star Wars discussion here on Evan Nova 95. Today we're going to be doing something a little different. Rather than a power ranking or an attribute deconstruction, this video will focus mainly on examining a single character, the Jedi Knight Anakin Solo. The grandson and namesake of the legendary hero Anakin Skywalker, Anakin Solo's tale is fascinating, but not for the reasons anyone ever intended. Similarly to characters from other franchises like Jean Grey, Anakin Solo is famous in the community for having been killed off relatively early due to executive meddling and ultimately serving as more of a symbolic motivation for other characters rather than a central player. However, unlike Jean, who eventually returned to her franchise with a fresh coat of paint and became arguably more beloved than she ever had been, Solo was never afforded such a luxury. While Anakin's death greatly influenced several storylines later down the road, such as the Legacy of the Force novels, there was never any genuine attempt to add significant dimensions to his character. He lived, he did stuff, he died, people grieved, and that was about it. He was touted as the next Luke Skywalker, but ultimately became the next Shmi Skywalker. Not that there's anything wrong with being Shmi Skywalker, but it's not exactly what most fans desired for him. This awkward development cycle has led many to view Anakin Solo as a waste of a character, as the years of build-up for him were utterly subverted. In this video, I will dive into the minutia surrounding Anakin Solo's death and give my opinions on whether or not it was a net positive or a net negative for the franchise. I will also be doing a brief What If segment at the end where I lay out what I would have done with the story had Anakin survived the Vong War. With all that out of the way, let's get started. Alright, so before we dive into Anakin Solo's death, Let's recap his story. Anakin Solo was the third child of Han and Leia Organa Solo and the younger brother of the twins Jason and Jaina. While his existence was prophesized by the unnamed instructor of the Kravaki Jedi Master Bodo Bas around the year 1000 BBY, he would not be born until 10 ABY, as depicted in issue 6 of the Dark Empire 2 comic series. His father originally wanted to name him Han Solo Jr., but Leia instead opted to name him after his maternal grandfather, Anakin Skywalker. Her reasons for this were twofold. Leia wanted to redeem her father's name, understandable, and she also believed that she could overcome her fear of Darth Vader by seeing, through her son, what her father could have been. Again, understandable. Anakin Solo's early days were fairly tumultuous. Despite having only recently made his exit from his mother's stomach, his life was very nearly snuffed out by the resurrected Darth Sidious, who attempted to transfer his essence into the infant to stave off death, only being saved by the intervention of Empado Jaius Brand, one of the few Jedi to survive the Empire's purge. At the age of 11, Anakin Solo attended his uncle Luke Skywalker's Jedi Academy on Yavin 4, where he quickly befriended fellow trainee Tahiri Vela, an orphan from Tatooine whom he eventually forged a romantic bond with. Anakin Solo's capabilities were evident from the moment he stepped foot into his uncle's temple. Studying under various masters such as Luke, Mara Jade, and the ancient Ikrit, Anakin would progress quickly in his Jedi training, with some even speculating that the young man's potential surpassed even that of his older siblings. However, despite his considerable talents, Solo often tensed under the weight of his grandfather's name, struggling to reconcile the heroics of Anakin Skywalker with the atrocities of Darth Vader. It was through the love of his family and friends that Anakin Solo eventually came into his own, accepting everything that his grandfather was and understanding that one does not need to be defined by the faults of their ancestors. Philosophically, Solo was very much the halfway point between his brother and sister. 
a pragmatic yet firm adherent to the living force. He often lived for the moment and was driven by a stubborn yet deeply compassionate unwillingness to sacrifice others. Though he was prone to second-guessing himself and questioning his actions when those he held dear were in jeopardy, once he made up his mind, he very rarely changed it. When the extragalactic species the Yuzhan Vong invaded the galaxy, Anakin, now a fully-fledged Jedi Knight, would bear witness to a tragedy that shook his family to their core. Accompanying his father and Chewbacca to the world of Senperidol to aid a refugee colony, Anakin was knocked down by a shard of wind-gust-propelled rubble, forcing Chewie to run after him. Chewie was able to bring Anakin to the safety of the Falcon, but another blast of wind knocked the Wookiee out of reach. Anakin tried to pilot the Falcon while Han rushed to the entrance ramp, hoping to lift Chewbacca up. The young man was forced to flee the planet when he realized it was too late to save Chewbacca, resulting in a rift between the Jedi and his father that would take many months to reconcile. Determined to ensure that no one ever died for him ever again, Anakin Solo would become one of the new Jedi Order's foremost fighters in their efforts to repel the Vong, participating in many notable conflicts such as the Battle of Dantooine, the Battle of Ithor, and the Battle of Yagdul. Two years into the war, Anakin would be assigned the role of commander of the Merkur Strike Team, a specialized group of knights consisting of himself, his siblings, Tahiri, Ganner Rydaso, Zek, Lobaka, Tekli, Tessar Sebatine, Alima Rar, Ulaha Kori, Ariel Bessa, Bella Hara, Kraysov Hara, Jovan Darak, Reynar Thule, and Tenel Ka Dojo. The team was formed for a single purpose to locate and destroy the Queen Template for the Voxen, a genetically engineered non-sentient species designed specifically by the Vong to kill Jedi. Tracking the Queen to a massive world ship known as Banu Ras in orbit over Merkur, Anakin's squad, now with the additional aid of the renegade Dark Jedi Lomi Plo and Welk, waged an over 30-hour campaign that few could even attempt. In the end, Anakin, as any true Jedi in his situation would do, chose to make one final stand against an oncoming horde of Vong warriors to buy the remaining members of his team time to accomplish their mission. Giving himself over completely to the light side of the Force, Anakin slew over a dozen Yuzhan Vong single-handedly, pure white energy pouring from his body in waves. Sadly, channeling such intense power for so long eventually overwhelmed the young Jedi Knight's damaged body, having already been mortally wounded going to his sister's prior aid. After a final surge of energy, Anakin Solo died as a beacon of light surrounded by Yuzhan Vong. Though shaken as any brother would be, Jason Solo was ultimately able to destroy the Voxen Queen and bring an end to a plan that could have turned the tide of the war. Anakin Solo's passing was immediately sensed by his mother, uncle, and aunt on Coruscant in a heartbreaking sequence that I honestly can't do justice to in this summary. Though no longer in the material plane, Anakin Solo's sacrifice would significantly impact the universe. In addition to serving as a rallying symbol for the NJO and the Galactic Alliance, Anakin's lightsaber would be wielded by Ganner in one of the most iconic last stands in the entire franchise, and later by Luke in his battle with Supreme Overlord Shimra at the war's climax. Sadly, even the noblest of legacies can be twisted to serve evil. Jason was deeply affected by his little brother's death, which played a significant role in his seduction to the dark side of the Force and eventual transformation into Darth Kytus, even going as far as to name his personal Star Destroyer after him. It would be from within this ship that Jaina Solo and Darth Kytus would have their final battle, its destruction an almost symbolic representation of the pain their family had endured. Two and a half years later, Luke and his son Ben Skywalker would encounter Anakin Solo's spirit within a realm of the Force known as the Lake of Apparitions. After a short discussion, the pair assured Anakin that no Jedi since his death had been as strong as him. 
Anakin's response was to tell Ben not to let other Jedi grow dependent on him, and that Jedi must have faith in themselves. Bidding his kin one final warning, Anakin Solo's ghost then faded into the mist. All right, now that we've covered Anakin Solo's story, let's get into the conundrum of his death. First, I want to make it as clear as possible that what I'm about to discuss is heavily laden with supposition. Even today, we don't know everything about what was going on behind the deflector shields with the new Jedi Order's production team and LucasArts, and we likely never will. Furthermore, while there is a bit of contradicting information regarding the death of Anakin, I will be appealing mainly to the majority of opinions that can be logically pieced together from various sources, as that is all we have to go on. Are we all on the same page? Okay, good, let's go. As I alluded to in the opening of this video, Anakin Solo's death, while iconic and a central point in the story of the Yuuzhan Vong War, was not the original intention of the series' many authors. The original idea was for Anakin to be the main next-generation hero of the story arc. He would discover new Force powers, vanquish the Supreme Overlord, and bring peace to the galaxy. Luke Skywalker would die, and Anakin would become his successor and lead the Jedi into a new golden age. If that sounds a bit similar to what ended up happening with Jason Solo, there's a reason for that. Back when the franchise gave a damn about aligning with overarching narratives, the NJO team sent several story concepts to George Lucas for approval before proceeding into production. Lucas endorsed many of these proposed concepts, However, there were three big ones that he vehemently rejected. Luke Skywalker couldn't die, the Yuuzhan Vong couldn't be Dark Force users, and Anakin Solo couldn't be the main hero. This led to a popular perception by fans that George Lucas demanded that Anakin Solo be killed and replaced with Jason because he was afraid the younger audience would get confused if there was more than one Jedi in Star Wars media named Anakin. Quite a few people were upset at this, and it's easy to see why. The idea that George would think that fans, even those on the younger side, would be too stupid to distinguish between Anakin Skywalker and Anakin Solo is more than a little insulting. Despite sharing the same first name, Skywalker and Solo are different characters with different personalities operating in entirely different settings. Maybe this is just my fanboy elitism showing, but I honestly have a hard time believing that even the most casual of Star Wars fans would read Labyrinth of Evil and Dark Tide 2 Ruin and assume that they were taking place in the same story arc. All that being said, while there is some definite truth in the fans' perception behind Lucas's decisions, there is actually more nuance to it than I initially expected before I started heavily researching this video. According to a set of old story memos shared by Pablo Hidalgo in 2013, Lucas felt that Anakin Solo's proposed trajectory followed his namesake's plotline in the prequel trilogy he was developing at the time too closely, stating that it was too redundant to the movie storylines and that books should be more original. Now, that's still dumb reasoning to kill off an established character, particularly from Mr. It's Like Poetry, They Rhyme. Still, it does at least suggest that Lucas's demands for Anakin Solo might have had less to do with killing the character and more to do with shifting his role. With that in mind, you can make the argument that the NJO story group were the ones who directly decided that Anakin would meet his end in the New Jedi Order Star by Star novel, which some authors have implied in various interviews. That being said, specific authors have also claimed that killing Anakin was a direct insistence on Lucas's part, despite it somewhat contradicting what was said in the memo. So, which is it? Did Lucas demand Anakin be killed and the story group complied? Or did Lucas suggest a shift in Anakin's character role and the story group figured that killing the Jedi Knight was the best way to go about it? 
I'd wager that it was something in the middle, but I have yet to find any reliable evidence to back that up. As to why Anakin's proposed storyline and Jason's were swapped rather than rewritten, we still have yet to find out. But my personal guess is that it revolved around cost saving. The team wanted to keep the story beats they did get approval on, so they opted to swap rather than scrap. Needless to say, this decision threw a bit of a hydro spanner into the ion drive regarding specific past storylines. Anakin Solo was deliberately built up for years as the, well, the second coming of Anakin Skywalker. He is literally referred to as the prophesied one in the memo I just talked about. Regardless of whether we know the finer details or not, it is fairly indisputable that Anakin Solo was intended from his inception to be the ultimate redemption of his grandfather's name, and possibly, big, big, big maybe, who knows, the true fulfiller of the prophecy of the Chosen One. Okay, that might be a bit of a stretch, but I'm just saying the NJO books and the prequels were in production at the same time as each other, so it's not unfeasible that the writers may have known about the whole Chosen One thing. Uh, especially when we consider that the Vong were originally pitched as Dark Side users. However, when viewed as is, the story of Anakin Solo feels a bit... stilted. Imagine for a moment if Anakin Skywalker had died on Mustafar in Revenge of the Sith. All the prophecies foretelling his coming, all the training he underwent, all the adventures he had, all the tragedies of his fall still happened, but then he just dies on Mustafar. The OT trilogy era moves on without him. Sidious takes on a new apprentice, and Luke never meets and redeems his father. That would feel a little off, wouldn't it? Like you'd probably expect a bit more of a resolution from such a prominent character? Yeah, that was the general sentiment felt by Anakin Solo fans the first time they read Star by Star. Even some of the creators found the circumstances behind Anakin Solo's death to be unsatisfying. Michael Stackpole, who wrote the Dark Tide duology, even went as far as to voice his displeasure with the decision to kill off Anakin during an interview on the Force.net podcast, which I will play for you now. By the way, the books were still relatively new at the time, and they wanted to avoid spoilers, so they bleep out Anakin Solo's name whenever mentioned, but that is who they are talking about. The, the uh, I don't, I don't even know if you, this is something you can talk about, but as you mentioned, the, the series kind of morphed as it went along, and you know, there were rumors that they kind of reassessed about halfway through whether they should still continue in a certain direction or whether they should kind of change things and steer it somewhere else. What uh, what kind of things were changed? What did the original overall plot look like that was different from how it ended up? Um, actually, given given that I've got a non-disclosure agreement, oh, um, yeah, that and, and I have an implant that begins to throb whenever I would reveal something like that, <laughs> I, I really can't can't say anything. Okay. Um, suffice it to say, I mean, there were some, some original design ideas that we had and certain timing issues certain events that we thought should happen earlier or later in the series that didn't. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things that was decided above my pay grade and that I never liked was dying. Mm, I, yeah. I, I personally thought that was a waste of a character. And this is part of the reason why I characterized him as much and did as much with him um, as I did in the two books I did in NJO, because I was hoping, hoping, hoping that um, maybe somebody would decide that he'd get it reprieve. Right. Um, so that was actually planned out that far in advance then? Dying was one oh, of yeah. the original? Interesting. Yep. Okay. Yep. Another prominent creator who disliked the overall handling of Anakin Solo was Troy Denning, who was the actual author of the novel depicting the Jedi Knight's death. While Denning has stated that he enjoyed writing the death scene, even noting that it had taken him around seven drafts to pen the sequence the way he wanted, he still had mixed feelings about killing the character. As indicated by Star Wars The Essential Reader's Companion, Denning had proposed the idea of resurrecting Anakin Solo at the climax of Legacy of the Force. According to the guide, Denning pitched an ending that would have revived Anakin by having Jason flow walk back to the moment Anakin was killed to further corrupt Tahiri into becoming his Sith apprentice, only to inadvertently make contact and switch places in time with Anakin. During Darth Kytus' final fight with Jaina, 
he would conjure the image of a mortally wounded Anakin to taunt Jaina and erode her focus. But, due to having already reached into the past, when Jason makes contact with Anakin again, they would end up switching places. In this manner, the timeline of past events would not be altered because a body that perfectly resembles Anakin would fall into the Banu Ras mission, when it is, in reality, the disguised husk of future Kytus. The dying Anakin is then transported to the future of Legacy of the Force, where he is picked up by Jaina and resuscitated. Okay, no offense to Denning intended, I adore his work, but I'm genuinely happy that his proposed ending ended up getting rejected. I understand wanting to right past wrongs, but bringing back Anakin Solo like that isn't the way to go about it, in my opinion. That's bridging on Disney levels of ridiculousness. It would have weakened the conclusion to Legacy of the Force, even though I'm sure Denning's depiction of Anakin reuniting with Tahiri and his family would be extremely wholesome. He's always been great when it comes to displaying deep emotions. Overall, the decision to kill off Anakin Solo was one that was marred in controversy that even after all these years is looked upon as one of the more peculiar behind-the-scenes elements of the Star Wars EU. But the question remains, was it the right choice? Now, I know this is going to sound like a massive cop-out, but in terms of overall franchise impact, I honestly believe that the mandated death of Anakin Solo resulted in just as many positives as it did negatives. I don't particularly appreciate that he was killed before he reached the apex of his character development, but I'm not going to pretend that his death didn't result in many story elements I enjoyed. Let's lead with the positives, because that's what you should always do in life. As I mentioned earlier, the actual sequence of Anakin Solo's sacrifice in Star by Star was, in my opinion, very well written, and, purely in the context of the narratives presented in the book, extremely well set up. Furthermore, as I also alluded to earlier, the sequences of Anakin's family reacting to the news of his death hit like a gut punch from a rancor. It's almost unnervingly realistic, and the raw emotional energy of the tragedy drips from every page. You can't tell me that when you read Leia collapsing on the floor wailing as she feels her youngest son's life force wink out, that you didn't just want to step in there and hug her, right? In terms of character development, Anakin Solo's sacrifice would foster profound changes in the majority of the NJO cast. Let's just start with the big one, Jason Solo. Jason's 180 from gruff pacifist to enlightened mystic was first spearheaded by his inability to save his little brother. As depicted in the novel The New Jedi Order Traitor, one of my favorite works in not only the series but the entire franchise, Jason has a dialogue with what may or may not have been Anakin's Force Ghost where he says, point blank, Anakin, you are so sure of yourself. So sure of everything. So strong. I really... I looked up to you, Anakin. You always seemed to know what to do next. Things were so easy for you. Everything's easy when you have no doubts. But that's what I wanted. To be sure. That's what I thought being a Jedi was. Don't you get it? You're exactly what I want to be when I grow up. What? Dead? You know what I mean. Okay, silly jokes are silly, but think about how huge that is. The Jason of the past would never have been so open or trusting with his senses, nor would he be as willing to acknowledge that his little brother had a more realistic grasp of the Jedi way than he did. Humanization like this made Jason Solo seem more relatable to me, and also made his fall years later all the more tragic. Speaking of which, Darth Kytus. Anakin's death was one of his chief motivations for doing what he did. While there is certainly a debate to be had on whether or not his character was handled in the best way possible, I honestly think that the structure of Kytus' descent into madness was pretty damn solid. He doesn't align with typical Sith doctrine, 
but that's clearly the point. He genuinely believes he's doing what's best for the universe regardless of his atrocities. And the roots of that self-aggrandizement can be partially traced to the role thrust upon him by his brother's sacrifice and Vergere's influence. I also enjoyed the development Solo's death sparked in Jaina and Tahiri. Tragic as it was, Jaina's inability to save Anakin was what finally opened her up to the idea that she doesn't have to carry the entire universe on her back. Even someone as strong as her can't go into every fight expecting to come out of it scot-free. There will be times when you need to put your ego aside and be willing to adopt new ways of thinking. And you see Jaina come full circle with this in Legacy of the Force. Tahiri, meanwhile, needed to learn the true meaning of Jedi non-attachment. Her ideation for Anakin Solo partly fostered her struggles with the dark side of the Force, which was itself facilitated by her deep-seated regret over not having had more time with him. Tahiri needed to learn that no attachment does not mean no love. Even in Luke's order, which is much less strict regarding Jedi relationships, there is still a clear distinction in its teachings between compassion and obsession. Anakin Solo's death sent Tahiri on the road to understanding that you can love as much as you want, but you also need to be willing to look at them as an actual person and not an ideal to be twisted to satisfy your own conscience. Ganoritiso! Do I even need to explain the impact Anakin's death had on him? Literally, his entire character arc came to a head with his acceptance of being true to himself and not playing to be what he assumed everyone else wanted him to be. As I said, there's a reason his last stand on Coruscant wielding Anakin's lightsaber is still considered one of the best moments of the entire EU. Ben Skywalker is also a character I would argue benefited somewhat from Anakin Solo's death. In addition to the general elements of living up to his older cousin's legacy, Ben would serve as something of a figurehead to represent the quote-unquote post-Vong generation. He grew up in the world Anakin sacrificed himself to build. His choices reflect the nobility of that sacrifice. I've never said this on camera as far as I could remember, but Ben Skywalker was in many ways the primary protagonist of the Legacy of the Force series. And I'm perfectly okay with that because I thoroughly enjoyed what they did with him. If you want to get a little conspiratorial, Anakin's mandated death might have even played a role in the author's decision to greenlight Ben's creation. Kathy Tears, the author of the novel The New Jedi Order Balance Point, once stated in an interview that the story team approved her suggestion to move Mara's pregnancy to earlier in the series, because it added more positivity to the current narrative. Was that because they thought having Ben be born before Anakin's death would soften the blow? Was that why Anakin was one of the first of his family to meet Ben after he was born? Was that why Anakin's sacrifice was juxtaposed with Ben's attempted kidnapping in Star by Star? I'm just saying, it could be a possibility. All that being said, Anakin Solo's death also brought a slew of negatives. First off, we have the obvious. Killing off Anakin Solo early basically kneecapped his entire story. As I've said repeatedly, they spent years hyping him up as the ultimate redemption of Anakin Skywalker's name. While his death did have a massive impact, it was not what the creators originally intended, nor was it what a lot of fans desired. It's the classic case of sacrificing prior story development in service of a specific framework. Everything Anakin Solo was or could have been was more or less thrown away to preserve particular story beats. One of the reasons I think the death decision soured many creators and fans was that when taken as a complete product, the whole thing does feel a little, for lack of a better word, cheap. It would be one thing if George Lucas's demands had come in after the book series had already begun publication, as the authors would have been forced to backtrack, but that seems not to have been the case. I am more than willing to be wrong about this, I'd prefer to be, but if we are to take the old memos Hidalgo shared at face value, then it seems like the story group had time enough to plan out the alterations to Anakin Solo's character arc before the first book hit shelves. 
This is just my subjective opinion, and I encourage anyone watching or listening to share their own, but from a literary standpoint, Anakin Solo's death doesn't read as well integrated into the story of the NJO books as the Vong's lack of dark side sensitivity, and I think that's where a lot of the issues lie. What's even more frustrating is that this could have worked. If the story group was committed to their decision to kill off Anakin, then they would have only needed to make a few alterations to make it feel more earned. Allow me to paint a picture for you. You keep all of Anakin's pre-birth prophecies, his adventures in Junior Jedi Knights, and everything leading up to and including Star by Star. The twist comes in Traitor. When Jason is grappling with his guilt, have it be revealed through Vergere or some other medium that Anakin's destiny wasn't so much misaligned as it was thrown off course. Have it be revealed that Anakin Solo was very specifically foretold to be the next chosen one, but as the Yuuzhan Vong are cut off from the Force, they are not subject to the usual constraints of Jedi prophecy, which is why they were able to kill him. By going this route, you can preserve Jason's journey through the latter portion of the series and add a whole new layer of terror to the Vong since they're essentially now plot armor proof. It doesn't matter if you're a focal point of Jedi destiny or not, you're just as vulnerable as everybody else. Additionally, as much as I adore the character development given to a lot of the cast due to Anakin Solo's sacrifice, even I'd struggle to argue that his death necessitated most of the forms of development given. Jaina could have still had her arc about trusting others if Anakin had merely been put on the brink. Tahiri could have still come to terms with non-attachment if her and Anakin were given more time. Would have been a nice little juxtaposition to the Skywalker-Padme dynamic, actually. And Ganner could have still had his hero moment just without wielding Solo's blade. Maybe the original intention was to give him Luke's. Who knows? At the end of the day, whether viewed from an optimistic, pessimistic, fan, creator, or literary perspective, the decision to kill off the character of Anakin Solo was indisputably a controversial move that sticks out as an oddity even within this franchise. Was he a waste of a character? Mm, no. Even after all these years, I still find him to be a very compelling Jedi Knight with a unique view of the universe who took part in many exciting stories. That said, I would also be lying if I claimed that his untimely end didn't drastically reduce his placement on the Skywalker totem pole for me. As interesting as Anakin Solo was, he never got the chance to reach complete character coalescence and therefore comes off as a bit stunted compared to some of his peers. I hate to say it, but when viewed through the lens of the entire franchise, I don't find Anakin as interesting a character as his older siblings or even his younger cousin. Not because he was poorly written, but because he didn't have nearly as much time to excel. Anakin Solo was a fantastic Jedi Knight who brought honor to his namesake and played a crucial role in one of the most incredible sci-fi storylines ever told but he could have been so much more. Okay, since we've mainly stuck to talking about death and disappointment for the last insert amount of minutes on screen, how about we wrap this discussion up with some talk about life? Here, I'm going to explore what I would have envisioned for the story of Anakin Solo had the Jedi Knight survived the events of Star by Star. As there are no official Infinity storylines or detailed authorial statements about this particular scenario to draw from, this is just going to be me making shit up as I go and having some fun. As always, I encourage anyone watching or listening to share their ideas as well. Structurally, I will be keeping my points on the broader side of the Force since the primary purpose of this video was to examine the official Anakin Solo story material rather than play fan fiction. That being said, if enough of you find my ideas interesting and want to see me make an in-depth, narrative-style what-if video on Anakin Solo survival, I am more than willing to do so. For now, this is what I have. 
So the initial setup for this scenario would likely occur in Star by Star Chapter 43 when Anakin Solo gave his siblings his final command to leave while holding off the Vong. In the original timeline, Jason heeds his brother's wishes and tearfully pulls Jaina away through the pit with him to complete their mission. However, let's say that in this timeline, Jason decides to ignore Anakin's commands and proceeds to charge into the flurry of Vong warriors alongside Jaina to rescue him. Logically, Jason and Jaina knew that killing the Voxen Queen should take precedence over the life of a single Jedi. But no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't bring themselves to leave their little brother behind. Anakin would, of course, protest the moment he senses his siblings coming towards him, but given his injuries and the horde of Vong warriors swarming around him, he really wouldn't be in much of a position to do anything about it. Jaina picks off a large number of Vong in her brother's immediate vicinity with her sniper rifle, while Jason stuns the rest with a flashbang grenade. Before the aliens can regain their senses, Jason swoops in and throws Anakin over his shoulder, fireman style. Pouring as much force energy as they can muster into a burst of speed, the twin Jedi rocket out of the pit with their brother in tow just as the remaining Vong warriors arrive. Two chapters later, we cut back to Jason and Jaina regrouping with their Jedi team just as they did in the original timeline, except now Anakin is with them. This is where things get a little tricky. The book makes it clear that Anakin was on death's door well before making his final sacrifice. Even if his sibling's interference had prevented him from going full force oneness mode and expending all of his energies, he still would have required far more medical treatment than what was readily available. As such, the only way I can realistically see the young knight surviving this mission would be if his comrades forcibly placed him in a healing trance while simultaneously pumping his body to the brim with light side energy. This wouldn't be enough to rejuvenate Anakin Solo, but it could keep him alive for a short period. Not the most creative scenario, but since everything in the book was designed to ensure that Solo wasn't getting out of that world ship alive, there's only so much you can do without journeying into the realm of absurdity. Jason is named team leader, and Lobaka can strap the comatose Anakin to his back in a humorous callback to his uncle Chewie doing the same to C-3PO in episode 5. From there, events would play out largely as they did in the original book. Coruscant falls, Jason destroys the Vox and Queen but is captured by Verger, and the Jedi Strike team narrowly get away. Just for the sake of thematic fun, let's say Anakin gave Jason his lightsaber just before being put under as a sign of both his appreciation and Jason's new role as team leader. Jaina would still of course be deeply distraught over losing her twin brother to the Vong, however, I don't think her struggles with the dark side of the Force in the novel Dark Journey would be quite as severe due to her desire to mend Anakin, serving as something of an anchor to her psyche. Her apprenticeship under Kip Duron would still happen, as she would still need to learn not to carry the weight of the universe by herself, except this time I can see her being more willing to accept his help than in the original timeline. Circling back to Anakin Solo, he would sadly be absent from the fight for quite a while. Making concessions to survive his mission is one thing, but his injuries were way too severe for him to bounce back with any expediency. If he wants to live and be useful to the war effort again, he's gonna need to be rebuilt from the inside out. His bones would need to be knit, his blood would need to be cleansed of amphistaph poison, several of his internal organs would need to be replaced by cybernetics, clone substitutes, or both, and his force energy reserves would need to be restored due to how heavily he was draining them to sustain himself. As far as parallels go, Anakin Solo's reconstruction would likely mirror what we saw with Galen Merrick in The Force Unleashed after Darth Vader spaced him. Outwardly, the Jedi Knight would look more or less the same, but his baseline physical hardiness would be enhanced considerably, which, when augmented further by the Force, would make Anakin into a veritable juggernaut. Maybe you could even have a humorous scene where a Vong tries to batter Solo as they did on Banu, but this time, instead of staggering him, it does nothing. A sort of, that shit won't work this time scenario. Regarding time frames, Galen was noted by the TFU novelization to have been out of commission for roughly six months. Anakin Solo would need the same at the bare minimum, 
especially since the Alliance would likely have to move him once or twice. Now, to keep him plugged into the story, I think it would be cool to have Anakin Solo go through a bit of a Force Dream slash Vision quest while he's put under. Have him feel some regret over failing his mission and the deaths of his allies. You could do some Naruto Kurama style craziness where he jumps through various points in his own life while simultaneously getting glimpses of what his family is dealing with in real time. Have him witness Empato Jaios Brand's sacrifice. Have him relive the death of Chewbacca. Have him witness Jaina's conflicts with Kip. Have him experience Jason's anguish in the embrace of pain. Have him grapple with the dark side if he somehow learns about his true destiny as the second chosen one and the Vong's very existence circumventing it. The possibilities are endless. Getting even more fanservice-y, maybe have it be so Anakin Solo's final Force dream is him being visited by the Force ghost of Anakin Skywalker. You could have Anakin 1 counsel Anakin 2 about accepting his mistakes and not letting prophecy dictate who he is. We could even end on something heartwarming, like Anakin 1 reminding Anakin 2 that his master, Obi-Wan's name, lives on as well, and that they are fighting to preserve that light too. The scene then pans to an image of baby Ben Skywalker sleeping in his crib just as the knight regains consciousness. Anakin Solo awakens with a teary-eyed Tahiri sitting by his bedside with a renewed spirit and a body that's stronger than ever. From there, I feel the broad strokes of the Yuuzhan Vong War's latter half would play out not too dissimilarly from the original timeline. Jason and Jaina would have their character development from Verger and Kip, respectively, and Anakin would have his from Ghost Anakin. The three Solos would come together with the rest of their family and lead the new Jedi Order and the newly formed Galactic Alliance in an all-out counter-offensive against the Vong. The final book, The Unifying Force, would proceed much the same way as it did, except this time, Anakin Solo would join Luke and his siblings in their final battle within Supreme Overlord Shimra's Citadel. Since much of the structure of the story up till now would have been as an ensemble piece rather than centered on Jason, I think it would be fitting that Anami's defeat would come through all three of the Solo children attaining oneness with the Force symbolizing their roles as the inheritors of the Jedi legacy just as Luke foresaw in his vision in Dark Empire. The Yuuzhan Vong are finally defeated, and the Alliance regains Coruscant. Though a bit less conflicted than he was originally, I feel like Jason would still opt to go on his Force journey as he would still have that drive to learn and his dislike of being viewed as a hero. Jaina and Anakin, meanwhile, would stay behind to help rebuild. As their brother traverses the stars, Jaina goes around breaking any sort of crime rings that try to take advantage of the post-war carnage while Anakin prepares for his most important mission yet. Taking his namesake's words to heart about preserving the light of the next generation, Anakin Solo begins instructing Ben Skywalker in the ways of the Force. He's still too young for formal apprenticeship, but given Anakin's warm and pragmatic personality, I can see him being much more successful at helping youngling Ben overcome his fear of the Force and truly accept himself as a Jedi. The galaxy enters an era of healing and growth unseen in generations. However, beyond the realm of the scene, a nest of death is brewing. A dark lady is scheming, and a chaos bringer begins to stir for the first time in millennia. But those, those are tales for another day. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of the unique life and death of Anakin Solo. I know this discussion was different from my usual format, so I'm excited to see what you guys have to say. As always, leave any thoughts or questions in the comments section below. May the Force be with you, stay safe, and I'll see you guys later.